I'd give a little more history since you seem to enjoy hearing history yesterday. Okay. Om Gana Timirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurn Militam Jaina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Jaina Bhutale Shayam Rupa Kodav Maiham Tadhati Shapalantikam Bandehang Shri Guru Shri Jatapadakamalan Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Shagrajatam Shagana Raganatan Vitam Stam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Prajana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Shagana Lulita Sri Vishakhan Vitam Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kam Shanagorangi Radhe Vrindavane Shuddhi Prishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Vodi Priye Vanshako Patarubhyascha Kripa Sindho Pyevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Yes, Um, I thought we could speak more about the history of putting together the Krishna book. First of all, I think I was a little, I think I sold short yesterday my godbrother, Hayagriva Prabhu, and his contributions uh, as editor. Uh, He was, in fact, an expert. He was a very good writer. He wrote um, a book, Hare Krishna Explosion, and maybe something more also. And uh, and editorially, his skills were quite uh, refined. He he edited the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the original Bhagavad Gita as it is, second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam and the first volume of uh, or the, yeah, the first of the two volumes, originally two volumes of the, the Krishna book and I learned most of, well not most, but I learned uh, much of what I uh, learned about editing by following the example of Vyagriva Prabhu uh, I would see um, how he did things and I would copy his approach and later when I began editing he would go over my stuff and make some corrections and so I would learn from that so we're all uh, and there was really no one else then who could have done what he did he, no one else had the, the skills so it was Krishna's arrangement that such a talented uh, devotee was there to assist Srila Prabhupada in putting together these uh, early, early works. <clears throat> now, The, as you know, the, the first volume was of Krishna book. Originally it was two volumes in this rather oversized format. And the Prabhupada's original idea was that Krishna's 
pastimes in Vrindavan would be the first volume and his pastimes in Dwarka, um, Mathura and Dwarka would be the second volume. And there were little chapter ornaments, I guess you would say, and little illustrations that went at the top of each chapter. Um, one illustration for the Vrindavan pastimes and another illustration for the the uh, Maturan Dwarka pastimes. The first volume, as I recall, had a picture of Radha and Krishna, and the second had the uh, picture of Dwarkadish. All the pictures were personally uh, guided and approved by uh, Srila Prabhupada. The artists, as you might remember from yesterday, we're located in Boston. We're working under Chaturani Devi. Grivo was working from Columbus, Ohio, where he was on the faculty of Ohio State University. And uh, the rest of us, well, Satsurup Maharaj was the original transcriber from Prabhupada's tapes. Prabhupada would send him the tapes in Boston and he would transcribe them. And then Hayagriva, Satsurup Maharaj would do a first editing, as I recall. And, so, and then Hayagriva would uh, do the second editing. The production crew was in New York at what was then called ISKCON Press, which was located in, um, now let me get this right, had we moved there yet? No, we hadn't moved there yet. Where were we working from? Were we working from 61 Second Avenue? I've forgotten exactly how, where we were located, but we finally moved up to Boston. From We were located in New York, of course. Um, and then we moved up to Boston. The this method of book production then was quite different than it is now. Now we do everything on a little desktop, um, a laptop, a desktop, any kind of computer is enough to do the whole, to do everything you want to do. Back then, everything was more specialized. It started, of course, with Srila Prabhupada and his dictating machine. At first, for the Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada had personally done the typing with two fingers on an ordinary typewriter. But um, early on, Gargamuni had seen in the window of a store a uh, Grundig dictating machine. And he thought that, well, maybe this is something Swamiji could use for his writing his books. So he went into the store and uh, bought it. And the salesman showed him how it worked and how to do everything and so on. Then he brought it to Prabhupada and Prabhupada at once accepted it. And uh, Kargamuni began to show him how to use it, but Prabhupada, he said, knew all knew right off how to, how to use it. So from there on, things changed. Prabhupada went from personally typing his books to dictating on, on these, this, what he called a dictaphone. A dictaphone is a, a trademark for a particular brand. And this was a Grundig dictating machine essentially a dictaphone. And it had, it was like a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. It had these tapes that would last, 
I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that, if that. And later, the company uh, went from reel-to-reel tapes to cassettes. The cassette was just a tape in a, in a, 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 a container. It was nothing really changed. Uh, and Prabhupada had just a small number of these, maybe f- five or seven, and he would use them again and again and uh, just record over what he'd already dictated. And he would, you know, want to keep like a close control. Of, uh, I have three, you have two, and so on. So they would always be coming back to him. So Prabhupada had one machine. The machine that you see in the videos or on in photographs is a shinier, more modern version than the one Prabhupada used for the Krishna book. Um, that was an older version mm, that essentially did the same thing. And it Prabhupada would, it had a little button that you could click to uh, record or to stop or to rewind. So Prabhupada would uh, click. I think you've seen on the, the videos. He'd click and speak and click and speak. And then he'd send the tape off to Satsrup Marsh. The tapes he would, to send it, he would use an old used envelope. He'd just turn it inside out and uh, staple it, as I recall, and put the address on. And, uh, didn't want to spend money on envelopes. And he would put a little sticker on it with the number of the tape, uh, Krishna book, chapter 47, or whatever, uh, which we collected back then, those little stickers. We had uh, in Boston the same machines, same type of machine that Prabhupada had. And so we would trans- transcribe the, the tapes Satsrup Marsh was the original transcriber, as I mentioned. Uh, I also did a fair amount of the transcribing once I came to Boston. Narayani Devi, who's here in Vrindavan, was one of the transcribers. I think Isha Dasi, and a few of us got in there and uh, transcribed the tapes. Transcribing was sometimes difficult you had, of, of course, there you had a, um, a foot pedal. So you'd sit at your desk and with a foot pedal you could stop and start and reverse and so on. And you had what was essentially a stethoscope sort of a thing, a little uh, to, to, to hear with. Although we someplace had a fancier set of earphones that we'd use to listen to something that was difficult. The tapes were, were not an easy job to transcribe because, um, well, Prabhupada spoke in heavily accented English, which itself was difficult. Sometimes you didn't know whether he was speaking English or Sanskrit. So you'd have to orient yourself. It wasn't always clear. Uh, Sometimes he'd be using unfamiliar Sanskrit words. And also, by the nature of the stopping and clicking, sometimes words would be cut short. Um, and so you, you, or they'd sort of, uh, they'd be, seem stretched or, or uh, mostly cut short. That's really what they were, they were cut short. And so sometimes there was a fair amount of guesswork You'd have to play it and play it back and play it back and play it back until you thought you 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 got it. And uh, and so we transcribed them means we typed them on typewriters uh, with a carbon copy. Do you know what carbon copies are? There was a sheet of what was, you, you have on your email a CC, um, carbon copy. Uh, 
Um, now it's a digital carbon copy. But back then, there was something called carbon paper, which was a, a sheet of um, plastic, really. I don't think it was paper. And on one side of it, there'd be a kind of carbon-like substance. And you'd put that sheet between two sheets of paper and so that the keys of the typewriter after hitting the first sheet of paper would also hit the carbon paper and the shape of the letter would be transferred onto the sheet behind it and so that sheet behind it would be a carbon copy uh, so now you know what CC means in your email program and you could do it, you could have two carbon copies and the second one would be more faint than the first one. You couldn't really go beyond um, an original and two copies. You wouldn't have enough force. So we'd make a, an original and a carbon copy on using typewriters. And sometimes we, uh, if we made mistakes, we'd just type an X through them. And if a word was wrong, you just type XXX through it and go on. And we'd type double space so that the editors could get in there and do their editorial work with old-fashioned pens. There were a lot of what's called mondegreens. You don't know what a mondegreen is. It's a word coined by an American 20th century writer who, as a child, her favorite ballad had a uh, Scottish ballad was, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was about where somebody or other who was killed, um, and the song said they, they killed poor Lord such and such and Lady Mondegreen. So she'd been very fond of this ballad, although she didn't know who Lady Mondegreen was. Uh, later she found out that what the ballad actually said was that they'd killed poor Lord such and such and laid him on the green. The green being the, the law, essentially. Uh, so, uh, she coined this word mondegreen, which means a, uh, a word that you hear that's plausible but wrong. Um, there were many mondegreens in the Krishna book, some of them only uh, lately discovered in the last few years. Um, one of them was a, a place where book said that um, Dwarka, Dwarka, I think Dwarka, was uh, fortified by uh, cannons. And one of the translators wondered about that. It seemed like uh, uh, something archaic, uh, an anachronism. You know, back in, in in Dwarka, you wouldn't have expected cannons. So um, we had copies of the tapes. Jadarani, um, the, our original artist, would take the tapes that Prabhupada sent and she would put the speaker of the dictaphone next to a microphone from a tape recorder and sometimes tape them together and make copies of the Prabhupada's dictation. That's why we have copies of some of the tapes of Krishna book. Otherwise Prabhupada didn't care about copying them. He just wanted to use them, not use the tapes and get them back. But she made copies and you can still hear those recordings today. So the, the uh, BBT staff went back and listened to that section about Dwarka and found out that Prabhupada had said that Dwarka was surrounded by 
of kennels. Yeah. <laughs> Which, of course, is canals. So, not by cannons. Um, another place had mentioned that there were, uh, among other paraphernalia, um, I think, I forget whether this was in Hastinapur or elsewhere, there were many horse heads. And it turned out that these were horse sheds. <laughs> a, uh, a third instance is that it was said somewhere that I think in the in the section concerning the shaman Takjul, that once in again it may have been Dwarka, there was um, uh, no not Dwarka. This once in the city of Kashi, within the barricades of Varanasi. Uh, there were uh, a shortage of rain, there were, there were droughts. Um, this is a problem because um, where is uh, Kashi within the, within the barricades of Varanasi? What's the problem? Yeah, they're the same. Kashi and Varanasi are the same place. Kashi, Benares, Varanasi, they're all names for the same city. So once within the uh, city of Kashi, within the barricades of Paranasi, there was a shortage of rain. So again, they went back to the tape and they found that what Srila Prabhupada said Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. What Srila Prabhupada had said was once in the city of uh, Kashi, within brackets, Varanasi. <laughs> so these were called Mondegreens, uh, plausible but mistaken hearings. So there were Mondegreens and other such problems. But anyway, the tapes got transcribed. Then they would be edited, um, first by Satsrit Maharaj and then by Hai Riva. And then they would be edited for Sanskrit by Pradumna. And then they would be typeset. The first typesetting machine was purchased by Hayagriva Prabhu. His wife, Shamadasi, was the first uh, typesetter. Back then, typesetting was mostly done on linotype machines, which were big, monstrous machines that set type using um, molten metal and gave you uh, slugs of type, which were then assembled in a, uh, what do you call them? My, uh, kind of a, there is, there's a technical name for it. I never used this stuff, but it, was, it would be assembled on a page. Um, then it was called linotype because it produced all the type in a line, and then the next line of type and the next line. And you would assemble all these lines and sort of uh, uh, what's the word? Mm, pack them all together. Hmm? No, not call it. You would, you just set them one one upon another, um, and then you you had sort of you you tuck them in essentially with uh, brackets, and then the image that the 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 typeset page would then be impressed upon a uh, a sheet of paper and that would be photographed 
and that the, the photograph would be a mechanical photograph, a big <coughs> uh, sheet of film, which came out as black and white, black with with clear letters, and that would be exposed onto a printing plate, and that's then your printing plate would go on your press, and that's how things were done. Uh, that later call came to be called hot type because the type was hot. <laughs> um, but right around the time that uh, we began, um, in the years when we began Krishna Book, something came in called cold type. Cold type was a different process. The IBM company, International Business Machines, came out with um, a, a machine that could um, do typesetting. It looked like a um, somewhat oversized typewriter. It had no electronics whatsoever. It was electric, but not. it had no logic, electronic logic, no circuit boards with uh, um, digital anything, entirely mechanical. And uh, it was ingenious. Actually, at that time, most typewriters, and you, you've, I don't, you've probably never seen one of these things, they had, uh, you hit a key and this bar would come up with an A or a B or a C. And uh, you would type as fast as you can and it would boom. And often you'd type too fast and two, two bars would join and you'd have to pull them apart. And IBM came out with something called the IBM Selectric Typewriter, which had what, they, what came to be known as a golf ball on it. Instead of, instead of those bars, it had a little golf ball. And according to which key you hit, a certain, um, the, the golf ball had like three uh, rows of letters on it. And it had little teeth on the bottom uh, so that the mm, mechanism could catch the ball and place the letter you wanted in the right spot. And so this ball would spin around and put your your letters there. And it became the ubiquitous uh, equipment in all the uh, corporate offices in New York City and uh, all the secretaries were using IBM Selectric typewriters uh, with great happiness because they were much better than the previous technology. But IBM also came out with something they called the Selectric Composer. Selectric Composer used similar golf balls, although um, somewhat different. And they, the, the glory of the machine was that it could, well, do two things. They could mix typefaces. So you had a choice of this face or that face, Roman, italic, bold, um, times Roman, or, you know, today it would be Caledonia or you know, what have you. Uh, and uh, you could justify the columns could make the columns even, which was a hallmark of every book worthy of its name. The columns would be even, whereas just typewriting, you know, has ragged, uh, ragged edges. So the, the Selectric composer could do all that. And so I agree with Prabhu bought one. They cost $5,000, which was a pretty penny back in uh, 1970, and his wife learned to use it. And I won't tell you exactly all the all that went into it, but you would have to type each line twice. Once you typed the line, and you'd take a sort of a reading. It would show you a number and a color, and you would tab over and type what the you know like a B5, blue five. And then you would go and set the same time, the same line again, 
but this time you would set a dial to B and another dial to 5 and the machine would insert the requisite amount of space so that all the lines would come out even. And um, so each line was set twice. Um, if you had a narrow column, you could just tab over and type it again. But in our case, we had larger, so we would just have pages of these first pass uh, typings with the codes on the right. And then we would go back and type the same pages again. When you typed it again, there were other things you had to do. You could have as many typefaces as you want, but only one at a time. So every time you wanted to change, say from Roman to italic, you would take out the golf ball and put a different golf ball in. Um, which, for the word-for-word -word meetings, was a lot of fun. Um, but the fun is only getting started. The real fun was the diacritical marks. Diacritical marks, those balls only had a certain number of spots on them. Um, it wasn't unlimited. Like now you have Unicode, which accommodates thousands of letters, uh, thousands of glyphs, as they're called, um, symbols. But you got like, I forget how many, basically enough to cover the lowercase and, and, and uh, uppercase letters and the usual punctuation marks. That's what would fit. Uh, but we needed uh, dots under the Ds, dots under the Ts, dots under the Hs, long Is, long As, long Us. R's with dots under them, M's with dots over them, N's with dots over them, um, R's with dots under them and long marks over them, L's with dots under them, and uh, I don't know if I'm missing anything, but that's, that's what we needed. So to get anything, you had to sacrifice an existing character. So we would sacrifice you know, characters rarely used, like a uh, a pound sign, you know, and uh, or an at, at sign, and we'd put a diacritic mark in there instead. Some of them were a combination of the letter and the mark. The I was like that because you, you couldn't have a dot sticking up in the middle of your diacritic mark. Uh, by sticking a diacritic mark over a regular eye. So we had one spot that was for the, the lowercase i with a make run, a long mark over it. Um, but if we did that for all the letters, we'd be in trouble. So we had one dot that we would use under the d's and the h's and the r's and the t's. Um, another long mark that we'd use over the a's and the u's um, and so on. <laughs> so you have the dots, you have the long marks, you have the, the eyes, each of these taking up a space on the font. And the R's were a particular difficult, and they'd be centered, of course. They'd be arranged in such a way that the dot would be in the center of the letter. The R, however, does not go in the center of the letter because the visual center of the letter is actually on the left. Right, the, you have the stem of the R with an overhanging shape, arc, arch there. So your dot has to be left. But we couldn't afford another dot. And so um, for, for doing the, the dots, there was something called a dead key. Uh, you would hit a a key that said, okay, we're going to hit this letter, but we're not going to advance. We're going to stay where we are, and then we're going to put a dot. So that worked fine, you know, you um, put like a D, and you wouldn't go anywhere, and you put your dot, and then you'd move on. But for the R, you did something like um, dead key, two units back, dot, 
two units forward, something like that. You would have to manually specify how you wanted to do those, uh, where you wanted to put the dot, and then you could move on. So that's how um, the composers, that's what the composers were dealing with. Um, those dots were only available from one company. There was one company in the world, as far as I remember. They were located in Honolulu, and they their business was modifying IBM golf balls. Um, and they didn't do it cheap. They were expensive little deals. Um, so, but we needed them. We we bought them. But uh, and then you know one for the italic, one for Roman, one for Bolt. Um, but the teeth would break um, by constant use. The teeth on the IBM golf ball would sometimes break, um, and then you would have trouble getting, the, you know, your, your, the machine couldn't find your characters. It could find some of them and not all of them. So then we would, we would replace the, ball, the, the golf ball. Sometimes it just was, was too much, you know, the, the golf ball would, would break, the tooth would break. But you say, well, we can still use it for this character, this character, and this character, but not for that character, that character, and that character. So you'd have essentially two golf balls that you'd have to go back and forth with just for, you know, times Roman. Uh, so that was another feature. The, anyway, um, and I could tell you more of the technical details, but um, that's how it would be done. Oh, and the, the, the for your final pass when you, put it through the composing machine. You would do it on a thick kind of paper. You just use scrap paper for the first one. For the second one, they had this, this uh, paper made with a kind of clay that made it thick so that when you hit your character on the paper, it would be the image, the impression would be crisp. So the, we would do that. Uh, it was costly also. And then when your page was done, you would spray it with a fixative, a chemical, uh, like varnish practically, uh, which was toxic and, and stinky. So you, you would have devotees sticking their arms out the window and spraying the, spraying the page, summer, winter, or in between. The What else about that? Oh, and then, so then it would go through a correction cycle, of course. The editing itself went through a couple of cycles. But then after it was typeset, there'd be Sanskrit proofreading, there'd be English proofreading, there'd be errors detected. The typist would have to retype the line or the paragraph. Uh, and sometimes they'd get, they'd generate new errors and they'd have to, there'd be a second cycle of proofreading and they'd do it again. And at the end, all of these pages, galleys, no pages, uh, you could call them galleys, they'd be assembled on what was called a light box. There were commercial light boxes, but we made our own. You had like a little wooden frame with a, fluorescent light, and then on top of that would be uh, frosted glass, a surface of frosted glass. On top of that would be a, a sheet of thick, a thin cardboard or, or thick paper with uh, faint uh, blue lines on it that showed where the page number would go, where the, where the lines of type would go, and so on. And then you'd paste up, this, you'd spray the back of the, the pages with rubber cement and fix them on these um, mechanicals. We, we had a name for them, flats, I think we called them. Uh, anyway, you, you'd fix them on these mechanicals using the, the blue lines as your guide for, for where to put them. 
were devotees who were, his job was that, doing that layout. And um, then you'd have to proofread it again to see that they got the right things in the right order. And they would have to paste in the corrections. Um, and it would get messy with all this rubber cement and so on. Later we got what was called a waxing machine, which would put a um, coat of wax on the back of the page, corrugated wax. And the corrugations would stick to what you wanted to stick the page onto. And uh, it, was, it was easier because you could pull it up and put it down and pull it up and put it down and it didn't wasn't messy like rubber cement so we we got a machine that did that for us um, but you would have to put in the corrections by hand there was something called an exacto knife which cut with which you would cut the pages so you could stick them in and then a line of corrections and sometimes it got so bad we would just correct one word and paste it on top and at the end, when it got really bad, we would take what was called a rapidograph, a fine point pen, essentially, and just carefully draw in a diacritic mark, you know. Uh, so that was layout. Layout, proofreading. Then, as I mentioned, uh, the finished pages would be shot, they'd be photographed, and then there'd be opaquing because the um, photo photographic process was imperfect. So you'd get white letters on a solid black background, but the solid black would sometimes have holes in it. And so you'd have to fill the holes with uh, an opaquing solution, which would be a dull red stuff. Sometimes the letters also would need a little fixing so so opaquing that was another process then the pages would be put in a certain order so that when you folded the sheets of the printed pages they'd come out in the proper sequence um, and then we would ship the, off the we would shoot those pages and those were the pages we'd shoot and then send that all off to Japan uh, all of this, of course, to save uh, money and also because it was highly technical to get somebody else to edit professionally that kind of work or to do that type kind of, kind of typesetting uh, to lay this all out would have been way beyond what we could have done. So all the devotees at the what was then called ISKCON Press uh, were engaged in that, in that service. We would go out for an hour a day and on Kirtan uh, every day and the rest of the time and the morning program, evening program. Uh, and then the rest of the time we were busy at ISKCON Press. I should also mention one further thing. Um, we ran the, the typesetting equipment uh, around the clock. The as I mentioned, that was a $5,000 machine, and um, we needed to, we couldn't just buy five of them. So we, the one machine that we had, we ran 24 hours a day. I'd spent a, a, a summer with the American uh, Merchant Marine, you know, just sort of as a deckhand on the ship, and they had uh, ships uh, four hours on and eight hours off. So you'd work, say, 12 to 4, midnight to 4, and then noon, noon to 4, and the rest of the time was off. So eight hours off, four hours on. It's also called split shifts. Um, so they'd have three, uh, someone 12 to 4, someone 4 to 8, someone 8 to 12. So we instituted that system for the typesetting. Our typesetters were Balai Dasi, uh, at different times, Balai Dasi, Palika Dasi, Mamata Dasi, uh, Mahamaya Dasi, and uh, a few others also. Um, 
Raga Mikadasi, and uh, so on. Uh, so they were doing that work. Um, you know, they would get up at and and do the, like the midnight shift from twelve to four or someone. And they'd go to Mangalarti, and then they'd crash. Um, and similarly, someone would come to relieve them at four in the morning. Uh, so we were running these these machines um, around the clock. No one did that. You know, a typical New York typesetting company. You start at nine and you close at five, and that's how they did it. But we worked from 24 hours. And as a consequence, the machines were always breaking down. We started with one. We eventually got two and maybe even three. And in Boston, by the way, uh, yeah, we had two in Boston, I think. One was in the basement. So I remember Pali Kadasi in the winter, you know, from 12 to 4 and 12 a.m. to 4 in the, in the bitter uh, Boston winters, uh, wearing gloves and typing Prabhupada's books. The, so these machines were, were breaking like anything. Um, they'd, they'd work and, and they'd break. And IBM was making a lot of money on what they called service contracts. They'd lease you the machine and then they'd have a contract. They'd come to your place and fix your machine. And, you paid a, a fixed sum, and that's how all the offices did that. And uh, that's what we did also. We had a service contract, but in our case, the service guys were coming every two days, every three days, uh, twice a day. You know, as soon as they would leave, it would break again. And it was exasperating. I remember at one point, our the, the guy in charge of the local IBM office was, you know, he's really cross with us because we were always calling him and we were always, we were so demanding and we had to have this and we had to have that fixed. And it was, you know, he, he, he was gruff and, uh, and we were dissatisfied. And I, I looked through the New York phone book. Uh, we weren't getting what we needed. I looked through the phone book and uh, IBM, and they had like a column and a half of numbers for IBM, all the various different departments. I found something that looked like it was relevant, and I called them up. I got this voice that sounded like it was from Satya Loka. <laughs> oh, really? Well, that shouldn't be happening. That's not what you should expect from IBM. You know. It sounded like I was talking to somebody on floor 64 of the Pan Am building or something, you know, from a paneled office. The next day, the manager and, and three tech guys were at our place <laughs> giving us a brand new machine, falling all over themselves and apologies. <laughs> and when we finally retired that machine, the... Uh, because I think they were leased. The, the, the IBM guys came and took them away. I remember one guy said, this machine doesn't owe you anything. In New York, we did this work from the second story, uh, a second story uh, space in a warehouse space on a street called Tiffany Place, which sounds very uh, upper class, but really it was sort of a uh, just near the, the dock area uh, near the East River and full of thieves and all sorts of people. So we would have devotees who would sleep up there uh, every night. It was called loft watch. If it was your turn for loft watch, you slept in the loft and uh, kept the thieves 
on notice that you were there. So these were some of, of the uh, conditions with, uh, under which the devotees worked, first in New York and then in Boston, and then again from Boston, the, uh, everything came down to New York. I think we didn't have all that equipment at first when we were in New York, but in Boston we did, and then it moved to New York with us. Printing was done by Dynapon. I think you've read that story in Prabhupada Lamaja, how Prabhupada negotiated with the Dynapon company. And uh, another feature of, of the proofreading, which was one of the steps, proofreading really means to make sure that your manuscript matches your, your final product. And the way that we, you would do that is you'd have one person reading and another person listening. And you would read out all your punctuation. Uh, once in the city of Varnasi, comma, uh, there was uh, a shortage of rain, period, and so on. You read it that way. And, um, but one day we, we wanted to see how university presses were doing things. So we, uh, Radha Balava, our press manager at the time, went to Princeton University Press to see how they, were, how they were doing everything. And he saw how they were doing everything. But one girl came up to him and said, can I speak with you? And uh, somehow she'd gotten a book or something. She was very interested and she wound up joining us. Uh, her name was Dukha Hantri Dasi. Uh, she was also one of the composers. And uh, so it was a profitable expedition. And from them we learned the technique that instead of having two people sitting, one reading, one listening, uh, you could dictate a tape and then the, the, the hearer could just listen to the tape so you didn't have to have two people sitting there uh, at the same time. So we adopted that that system. And that's probably about it for um, today, about production. Tainapan was the, the printer. And of course, we had no idea how to distribute books. We would just uh, get them and try to distribute book here, try to distribute the book there until the devotees and on the west coast of America, uh, found out that they could distribute large numbers of books. You know, they distributed 20 books in a day or something, which was uh, enormous. And uh, that's a separate history, which has been recorded, I think. It's, I it's, we can read about that. Any questions? These are the... Uh, Another kind of Krishna book pastime, the pastimes of putting together the book. Yes. Raj, one thing I wanted to hear is because you mentioned you are basically working nonstop and you had morning and evening program. What were they actually? What was your morning program was not much different from today's morning program. Um, Mangal Arti, Japa, Tulsi worship, Nishanga prayers, Guru Puja, I think. There was Nishanga prayers at that time? Yeah, Nishanga prayers from the day I joined, Nishanga prayers were there. We didn't sing them, we, we, we spoke them uh, responsibly in Sanskrit. Nobody knew the tune in, back then. Um, but yeah, the Shringa prayers, they were originally introduced as being a prayer for Srila Prabhupada's health. As you recall, he'd gone back to India with, um, after a heart attack. But we kept those prayers. Um, then there'd be a Bhagavatam class, perhaps not quite as sophisticated as today. And we didn't have responsive chanting and all of that. It was just somebody would. Uh, read the text and 
and uh, give a kind of a talk about it mm-hmm. and prasadam. There were no yes, we had deities. So the deity, the greeting of the deities was there. These things were sort of just being introduced then. Nectar of devotion was our teaching us how to worship the deities and so on. That hadn't come out. So we were in a very embryonic stage. But our morning program was like that. Our evening program would be um, Arti Kirtan and uh, class again. Bhagavad Gita. And the kirtans were fantastic. Kirtans back in those days were great. Uh, simple and uh, one tune throughout. Easy to follow. Karthas Matanga. Enthusiasm. All Hare Krishna. And especially, you know, as time went on, we got really expert Kirtaniyas like Bharan Raj and Jai Sachinandan and others. The devotees would race to be to be there. The Kirtans would be so uh, enlivening and wonderful. The devotees would all want to take part. And the press workers especially were very enthusiastic in their sadhana. That's what kept the press going. Uh, very enthusiastic in morning program, evening program, hearing, chanting. And as I said, an hour a day of uh, going out on the kirtan party also. So how was that? For one hour everybody was going home. We would jump in a van, go out for an hour, jump in a van and come back. And the result was that we got so much more done. It's not that we lost an hour, we gained three. Nothing like purifying your your heart for an hour on the the streets of New York City to make you more productive and happy. Yes. Um... So in philosophy, they have this example of a ship, and then they are asking um, if you every time uh, change a part of that ship, you change the wood, at what point does the original ship cease to exist and a new ship uh, is made? So similarly with the books of Prabhupada, if all these small changes come throughout the years, now they have the hermeneutics seminars and all of these to discuss, um, how can we be sure that we stay true to what Prabhupada gave. Well, of course, this is a long topic with which I'm not directly involved anymore. But first thing is, I think the total changes made in, say, well, first of all, the places where most of the changes are is in the Krishna book and Bhagavad Gita as it is, because those were earliest books done from tapes especially. Bhagavad Gita not entirely from tapes. Yishupanishad was totally typed by Prabhupada so it was easier to work with. Bhagavatam first and second canons were totally typed by Prabhupada. But Bhagavad Gita and Krishna book were done from uh, dictation and so and nectar devotion also. So That's where you'll find most of the uh, revisions. Once you get to fourth canto, fifth canto, sixth canto, seventh canto, it's much less. Prabhupada's traveling with his own Sanskrit editor. Sanskrit editor is much more experienced by now. Um, the devotees who are typing know Devan Agri, and she's traveling with Prabhupada, Pradumna's wife. If there are questions, they can ask Prabhupada on the spot. So as you go along in the later history of the books, there's much less uncertainty or uh, many fewer errors. But in the early days, 
you have this dictation, you have editors who are less experienced, we're not as familiar with the philosophy, we haven't read the other, we don't have the benefit of having read beyond first canto and uh, the Macmillan abridged Bhagavad Gita, so we're not, and TLC, so we're not that familiar with what's going on and various other problems. You weren't as expert in hearing Prabhupada and you're just making out what words he's using. So um, you have many more errors in the, those early books. But still, I think the total number of revisions, you know, you hear these shocking figures like 5,000 revisions, which includes things like uh, commas. And it, that comes to, in an 800-page book, someone can do the math or take out your, your, your iPhone calculator. But you know how many, how many corrections is that on a page? Three, five. When you include punctuation, you're, it's not quite as shocking as one might think. I think the total number of revisions, or the yeah, the total number of revisions, winds up showing you that the book was revised by like not my, not more than three percent, five percent. I think that's the the number Dravida Prabhu, our present chief editor, has given means not a whole heck of a lot. Um, <clears throat> the editorial philosophy of the BBT is to keep the books as close to Srila Prabhupada's intention as possible. Um, that places limits on what you can do. You can't just say, well, I like it more like this, or I like it more like that, or I think this is this would be a better meaning than that, or or I disagree with Prabhupada about that. It has to be that the the, the overarching idea is to bring it closer to what Prabhupada said. That's the standard editorial model followed um, among academics who are in the field of what's called textual scholarship. Um, textual scholarship is a specialized field and there are, it's, it's a, a discipline and there are do's and don'ts. There's way to do, ways to do things and ways not to do things. And they, they do this for authors like Hemingway, Mark Twain, um, you, you, you name him. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, and on and on and on. Most, uh, to say nothing of Shakespeare and and, uh, and um, other texts. <coughs> so it's a, a discipline in which the the purpose is uh, really the opposite of uh, well, purpose is to see that the author's intentions are there on the page. And when you find out, and there are various ways in which it can be something other than what he attended. An editor could have speculated and speculated wrong. Um, a word could have been misheard. A word could have been mistyped. Um, a typist I might have skipped from line six to line eight. That's a common error. Um, and various other ways that things can go wrong. So the, the BBT has tried to uh, see to it that the, the publications match what, what Prabhupada um, intended. It requires a certain amount of faith, that is to say, if you think your, your editors are a batch of uh, screwballs or demons or um, people who are just uh, off the rails, and you're probably really going to be in fear about what could happen to the books. And if you have faith that they know what they're doing, you'll probably uh, 
<laughs> be un, undisturbed in your sleep by such things. Um, the BBT has now put a review board in place to sort of double check the work of the editors. And you have also a large uh, readership that sort of serves to check what's been done. The large readership is largely ineffective because they don't read that carefully or they don't have clear ideas of what good editing is. Um, a typical error is to see in this edition it was A, in this edition it was B, oh my God. And they leave out uh, looking at the original manuscript to see what Prabhupada had said. Um, and uh, so they have no way of finding out that actually the manuscript said B. Um, that sort of, uh, and this of course is the this, this, this sort of stuff that goes on on Facebook and social media and uh, what have you. But um, how did I get there? Oh, this, but so the main editor, the main people who, who police, as it were, or correct the editors are the translators. Um, we have translators in Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati, French, German, Indonesian, uh, Spanish, and, you know, dozens of languages, Russian. And they, those translators sit there and look at those words and meditate on them and ponder them and interrogate them and uh, really inspect them. Prabhupada said the, the quality of a, a, an editor is that he should be scrutinizing. So these devotees really scrutinize, uh, particularly if they're working with a language like Russian. They have to know what part of speech uh, a word is. It's not enough to know that it's Krishna. Is it from Krishna, by Krishna, to Krishna, in Krishna, uh, through Krishna? You know, that we do all that with prepositions, in, to, from, of. But in Russian and other inflected languages, you do that with case endings, uh, with the way that the words end. So um, they need, to, so they care about all that, which matters a lot in. in word for word meanings especially. But they they inspect all these words. Um, many of these editors are reasonably conversant with Sanskrit also. Um, and so they see something like in Bhagavad Gita, asat falls, F-A-L-L-S. And they say, hold on, asat falls? No. Asad is false. Asadit yuchate parta. Uh, Asad means false. So then they uh, send a, a memo to Dravida and say, uh, you know, what is this Asad false thing? This is not Asad false. That's a, an error. And so the, the, the best uh, police force or the, the best inspectors, the most scrutinizing uh, readers of the revised or, or less revised text are the translators. They're the ones who catch more errors than anyone else these days. And they're the ones also who, if something has been wrongly revised, most often uh, catch the, the mistake in revision. So they're highly qualified people. To be a general reader is, is good, but to be a translator means you're really uh, focused. Here Rup Sanatan, here he's our Dutch translator. So um, he has direct experience of what it's like. You really meditate on that text. Uh, you, you inspect and and think about every word because you have to put it into your language. So, um, in one sense, they're the best. They're the best, best source of guaranteeing 
seen to the integrity, as well as the general readership. It's not that only translators, sometimes uh, other readers catch errors or question revisions and bring up really valid points. So, uh, so thoughtful readers can also uh, contribute. And they, they do, they, they send their, their queries, used to be to me, now it's to Dravida. And our, our policy is to answer them and uh, sometimes to implement what they've found. Maybe one more question. Um, you said that at that time everyone was still in the beginning, still learning. I was wondering how was it possible that someone was a Sanskrit expert at that time? Well, we had Pradumna Prabhu. He was the only person who knew Sanskrit at that time. And he, uh, he was new. He taught himself Sanskrit, went out and got the books. Actually, he he um, he began by tra transliter uh, transliterating. Prabhupada had he wanted the books to be in uh, according to this scholarly standard with diacritical markings and so on. So Pradumna learned um, David Agri and learned the system, and he was the one who was putting in the diacritic marks. Um, but he didn't confine himself to diacritic marks. He learned Sanskrit and became uh, an expert uh, in in Sanskrit uh, to the point where, uh, when Prabhupada was leaving, uh, it was Pradumna who was translating the commentaries and speaking them to Prabhupada so that Prabhupada could um, respond to them or comment according to what the Acharya said. So that last chapter of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, the last one Prabhupada did, is almost a collaboration. Not almost, it's really a collaboration between Pradumna and, and Srila Prabhupada. And the other devotees in the room who were also asking questions and Prabhupada would respond to them. That's a, a unique chapter. Um, so this is an example, the Dami Buddhi Yogam Tam. Krishna says that if one is devoted, I give him the intelligence. Uh, of course, yena ma mupiyanti te, by which they can come to me. But he also gives the intelligence by which they can do their service. When Lord Brahma wanted to create the universe, Krishna basically told him how to do it. And he similarly inspires or instructs other devotees. So that very often Prabhupada would tell devotees that there was no need of, you know, university education or taking courses in this and that, but by doing the service, they would learn. We saw that in our book distribution, nobody's really gone to marketing school, um, and yet we're distributing you know, millions of, of, of books, and sometimes even people who are in marketing departments, they sit in the airport and watch our people. <laughs> <laughs> And then make them offers, you know, would you come work for us? Uh, by their enthusiasm, by their dedication, they find that Krishna reciprocates and teaches them what they need to know. So maybe in the beginning we make some mistakes, just like now they're rebuilding the Palace of Gold. Because the original construction was not exactly according to all the standards, but the devotees had dedication, enthusiasm, and whatever uh, shortcomings were there could be fixed later. So our whole movement has grown up like that. The, uh, now, of course, we have more people involved who are skilled professionals and experienced in various fields, but Prabhupada picked up people who, for the most part, had uh, the high grieve was an exception. Had little or no experience in what they were doing. Pramananda had no experience in running a corporation or being the president of a temple. Uh, the devotees had no experience in deity worship or you no. Know, they weren't experienced speakers. Um, 
but the Krishna helped. So Iskand Press, later the BBT, got its start that way and largely continues that way by the the efforts of sincere devotees who you never went to translating school or anything like that. Hmm? One course. But uh, Rup Sanat, since an expert translator, he's also become an expert production manager and an expert uh, publication designer. He's a very fine taste in publication design. So all of these things uh, when we dedicate ourselves to the service of Krishna and the spiritual master, Krishna helps us. And the, the, the book department, publication department, is one example of that. But throughout the society you'll find devotees who just dedicated themselves to serving and got help from Krishna as needed. And still that's going on since the time of Brahma. Anything else? Just something very short, Maharaj. I was wondering, so during this process, because Prabhupada was present, and when you had to go through the books and basically yeah, seeing where are the mistakes and then working again on them. Shri Prabhupada, he was more putting focus on the books to go fast out or everything should be done extremely carefully and attentively or somewhere in between? Well, he, he emphasized both things. To, to me, he said that an editor should be very scrutinizing. There's one famous, famous letter where uh, Prabhupada was reading one of the small books and found numerous errors. Um, uh, Prabhupada, I remember he made a sarcastic re remark in the letter, what is this Bud Buddha Swa? He said it's Bu Buvar Swa, it's the Gayatri Mantra and everybody knows it. And there were similar, he said, this is a very interesting word, neither Sanskrit nor English. <laughs> <laughs> How have such things passed by the eyes of so many editors undetected, you know? So he, he wanted, he, he said at one po point, if there was even one mistake, it would murder the whole book. So he, he did want it to be uh, carefully reviewed and carefully um, done so that it would be free of errors. But what I most often heard from him was speed. Uh, especially since, you know, we work at our pace and we turn it out. And, um, but for Prabhupada, he, he, was, he had an urgent mission. The world is waiting for these books. If we can't give them to it, give, give, give them the books. It's our fault. So he really, like for Bhagavad Gita as it is, that's the, those are the letters I got from Prabhupada. You said it would be ready by this time. Now you're saying it will be ready by that time. You know, he, he wanted it fast. He wanted it fast. Um, he, in an early letter, he, he said, so, you know, this many, uh, one day for this, one day for this, one day for this, one day for this. And at the end of, you know, a week, you have this. You know, now you've got these 10 pages, then another day, another day, another day, so 20 pages, and at the end of a month, you know, you have one book like that. You're just doing the math and, uh, yeah, just making it a mathematical uh, question. If you do this many pages in this much time with this many people taking this many days, at the end of a month, you have a book, and at the end of a year, you have... 12 books and so on. Um, so he wanted them fast. He wanted them fast. That was the main emphasis that I saw. He wanted them correct and he, he, he did say that. He did instruct us that way. But particularly he wanted them fast. And the, the, the uh, most prominent example was the 
um, marathon that he had us do for Chaitanya Charitamrita, where uh, Prabhupada was ahead in his dictation. We were how many books behind? 17? I think 17 books. Um, you know, all of Madhulila, all of Antyalila, maybe one volume of Adilila. Um, plus two volumes of Fifth Canto. You know, he dictated all of that and it was all somewhere in production. So we just, we left behind when Prabhupada was doing, at that point, we'd shifted to Los Angeles from New York. And shortly before we'd acquired new typesetting, a new typesetting system, we'd gotten rid of the IBM machines and traded them in for what was then the, the leading edge technology, phototype setting, uh, which involved big computerized machines, um, expensive machines that produced typeset copy on photographic paper, which you would then send through a big, monstrous uh, developing machine. Um, and then you, that would be your your typeset galleys, which you would then paste up and so on. But of course, that it went much faster. So when we moved to Los Angeles, Prabhupada came and toured the press and saw all this fancy equipment, he said in India, I was dreaming about something like this. And then on his morning walk the next day, he said, basically, I'm 17 books ahead of you. I think you can do these 17 books in two months. And we were doing one book in two, in two months. And we thought we were doing good. We thought we were doing very well with, with uh, a book every two months. You know, carefully done, and good standard. You want 17 books in two months. So... Um, at that rate, you're not going to be quite as scrutinizing. But he wanted them fast. I think he said, in fact, Pradumman, maybe it was remembered, if there are mistakes, we can fix them later. Chaitan and Charitamrita. Even on the, on the paintings, they were tearing the paintings out of the artist's hands banging down the doors, you know, to, uh, you know, your deadline is over. There's a, a painting of Rukmini fanning, it's, perhaps it's Sudama Brahmana, and the Chamara has no handle. <laughs> Better? Uh, Prabhupada said that uh, his books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. But we can see that language changes um, relatively quickly. I mean, we can look at first edition books. You mentioned Shakespeare, and there's so many others from that age. Can't be understood by modern English speakers. Yeah, Chaucer would probably be a better example. Shakespeare is at least intelligible to an ordinary educated person. Chaucer, Chaucer, you need special education. But as far as uh, translating, I mean, we're not really speaking Sanskrit and less and less people in the university and you know, in traditional education are studying the original languages, Sanskrit or Latin or whatever it may be. And language is evolving increasingly quick all languages, not just English, but you can look at first edition books from 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 600 years ago. So we're coming ago. to the point where English will no longer be, in 19th, 20th century English will no longer be intelligible to a, a modern reader, reader of the future. So BBT will have to deal with that. Fortunately, I won't be able to, I won't be here to be criticized for whatever decisions they take. <laughs> But has anyone ever thought about this? That, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a known issue for a long time. I mean, just in my short years, I'm less than a 
century old. And yeah, if you look at what's happened to a, a word like gay, for example, you know, one one commentator said, "Weep for gay." You know, the word is lost. It used to mean happy, uh, carefree. Uh, the word is gone. It has an entirely different meaning today. So that will happen. The, uh, and of course, it's, anyway, well, the future generations will have to see how fast it happens and to what extent the books are still intelligible. The original I mean, 20th century books will still be presumably av uh, available uh, just like somewhere. Some, just like some of those classics, they're collector's editions, but only the most elite educated people can really understand the meaning of the author of those first edition books. Yeah, and partly it's the fault of, anyway, the fault of the educational system. People are becoming increasingly illiterate. But that's another, in any case, as far as to avoid a sort of broad ranging question, uh, the, the BBT or wh whoever's responsible for publishing in the future will have to, to deal with that and, and say, what do we do? Um, Prabhupada's book should be read by the, the greatest number of people. They should be understandable. They should be accessible. They should be, um, you know, law books in everyone's hands. Um, but it's difficult because they're in a language that nobody <laughs> speaks anymore or a, a language that doesn't mean uh, what it used to mean, even my my book, Vanity Karma. Um, vanity doesn't really mean for most people what it meant when that word was uh, used in the King James Version of the Bible. It used to me mean uh, nothingness, meaninglessness, um, vanity. You know, he worked in vain. Now vain means proud and vanity means pride. From you know, as a primary meaning. So all of these things, um, biblical translators have dealt with, Trent, uh, Shakespeare's publishers have dealt with, uh, publishers of other uh, old authors have dealt with, and so um, Prabhupada's publishers will have to deal with it. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. We have now more than reached the end of our time, so we can have a little kirtan. And perhaps tomorrow we'll start the actual reading <laughs> or resume our actual reading of, of Krishna book. But I hope you found the, this historical session uh, worthwhile. And thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Uh, Krishna, 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 Krishna,